my name is Rabbi Finn and you are here for another week of Shabbat snacks on board and Elstra United Synagogue. Every week I'm going to show you something which is to make at home, which is related to that week's Torah portion. This week is Parshat Ba'era and we are making jam thumbprint biscuits. That's quite difficult to say. You try saying that 10 times very quickly. Jam thumbprint, no, I can't even do it. Jam thumbprint biscuits. These are really yummy, cute little biscuits uh, which are going to be covered in icing sugar with a bit of red jam in the middle. Mwah! And you know what? They are so easy to make. And for those of you who are having to homeschool, this is a really nice activity to do with your children. It is so easy. So I'm going to start off. In my bowl, I've got 100 grams of butter. You can decide to make this parav, i.e. dairy free, and use margarine instead. It will work just as well. The butter should not be straight from the fridge, but you don't want it to be too warm either. You want it to be soft enough that you're able to mush it with your hand. The reason I'm going for butter, well, is simply everything tastes better with butter but also if you make it dairy it means you can't have it after a meaty meal which means you're less likely to snack on these if you've had a meaty meal for let's say dinner or something so that's why i'm doing it two reasons so in there butter add to it 250 grams of white flour this could be self-raising this could be plain this could be bread flour it could be pastry flour it doesn't really matter as long as it's 250 grams of flour so in there I'm gonna now add 25 grams of icing sugar. And finally, 100 grams of white caster sugar. If you don't have caster sugar, use granulated sugar. And what you need to do is put your hands in and um, push the butter and the flour and the sugar together through your fingers. Slight problem is this bowl is gonna to be too small. So let me go transfer into a different bowl and I'll be right back. And as if by power of magic, I've transferred into a different bowl, just move a cup out of the way. And as I say, get your hands in and you want to push the mixture through your fingers. It's basically the same as making a crumble mix, um, just not uh, sugary enough for it to be a beautiful crumble, but this is gonna create an amazing soft biscuit. So as I'm doing this, let me tell you about this week's portion. This week's portion is Pasha Ba'era. It is the second portion in the book of Shemot, the book of Exodus. And this tells the story of the first seven of the 10 plagues. The plagues are brought by God against the Egyptians in order to free us, in order to free the Jewish people, to let us be finally free of Pharaoh, of the slavery which was backbreaking, demoralizing, psychologically and physically hard labor. Um, but what is really interesting about the plagues is that actually they can be grouped. We do it on Saturday night where we stiff popping it in the one we go to Sacha, Dashri, Achad. Those are three groups and those three groups actually have their root inside the Torah. Because before the first three plagues, blood, frogs, and lice, God turns to Moses and says, I'm doing these plagues, and as a consequence, we have to um its time, and Egypt will know, Kiani Hashem, that I am God. The first three plagues were there to bring about the revelation of Hashem in the world, to bring God into the narrative. And it works, because by the end of the third plague, by the end of a plague of lice, the Chartumim, the uh, sorcerers of Egypt, they say, Kimhi, it is the finger of God. So therefore, God is now acknowledged by the Egyptians. The second set of plagues, the wild animals, the pestilence, the boils, well, these were, to use God's words, Ki adum is fine, that Egypt will know, Ki ani Hashem, that I am God, but kere it's in the midst of the land. There could be a claim against Hashem that Hashem created the world or Hashem is a deity but it's not involved in the world. Sure Hashem exists but Hashem doesn't get involved in the day-to-day -day running of the world and therefore can't distinguish for example between the children of Israel and the Egyptians who are both from the Middle East both looked very very similar. So these three plagues are the first time that we actually get explicitly told inside the Torah text that they only impacted, only affected the Egyptians. These are the first three plagues that we are told specifically happen to the Egyptians and not the children of Israel. The final set, of which we have the first one in this week's Parsha and two more in next week's Parsha, leaving aside the uh, death of the firstborn, which is something completely different. The final set, which is the hail, the dark, uh, the locusts and the darkness, they are that the people of Egypt will know that I'm God, but know that I'm God, not just as a deity, but the deity. There is no other gods. I am a God who can do something that no other beings on this earth can do. How am I going to demonstrate that? By doing these supernatural plagues. Let's work backwards. Darkness. Darkness wasn't simply turning out the light. It was described as 
double darkness. It was a paralyzing darkness. It, the Egyptians literally could not move because it was a, such a thick environment around them. The locusts were not just simply a swarm of locusts, but these are described in the Torah as a swarm that had never happened before and will never happen again. Again, completely extraordinary, even on top of the other plagues. But finally, we have this week's plague from that section, and that is the plague of hail. Now, hail, when you think about it, is little balls of ice which bounce, and if they hit your head, you get a bit of a sore head, or they might crack the, the windscreen where you are. Sometimes we see in the news that they're the size of golf balls, but this hail was extraordinary because inside every golf ball size of ice was fire. These were effectively Molotov cocktails encapsulated by ice. So you'll get hit by the ice and then fire would explode everywhere. So it's literally fire and then in, uh, um, covered by ice. Hence why we are making these jam biscuits, because I think these in a way represent that miraculous hail, because we're going to have the white cookie on the outside and the bit of jam in the middle, which represents the flame. So that is why we are making these jam cookies. Now, as I've been describing this week's portion and explaining how they come about bringing this revelation of God into the world, I've managed to crumble up my mixture. Let me just show you it. It now resembles breadcrumbs. Perfectly, uh, perfect breadcrumbs, really quite nice. You can't feel big lumps of butter anymore. The sugar and the flours are all mixed together. So I want to add in a pinch of salt. The reason you add in a pinch of salt is because this is what makes it moorish. This is what means you can't stop like just nibbling at these biscuits. So a pinch of salt and then just give it another mix and a bit more salt and just give it a mix with your hands. Once you've done that, let's move the salt out of the way, add one egg. Literally one egg. I like to pour it all over. And before you continue mixing, add, I would say probably a quarter of a teaspoon of vanilla. It doesn't matter if you go to half a teaspoon, just a little splash of vanilla. You could stick your hands in now, but actually I would prefer to use a spoon just to keep my hands not completely gunky, but you are gonna be sticking your hands in in a moment. So give it a really, really, really good mix. Round. It's not going to be a wet sticky dough at this point. You just want to mix in the egg so that your hand isn't going to be completely yuck. Then use your finger to scrape off the dough. And now is the point that you want to use your hand. Again, get your hands in the mixture and push it together with your hands as if you are trying to form it into a dough. You might need to add a little bit of water if it's just too crumbly, but I find just working it, it depends on the size of the egg that you've used. If it's been a smaller egg, you do need to add some water. If it's a bigger egg, you probably won't need to. By the looks of things, I'm going to need to add a little bit of water because it's not quite coming together. I'm going to be able to need to put this into little balls which are gonna hold their shape. Although actually, as I keep mixing and kneading, it is starting to come together. So I'm gonna add literally a splash of water. You don't want to do too much, otherwise it's going to become too wet and too unworkable. If it is too wet, add a little bit more flour and a little bit more sugar into the mix. Perfect. So let me show you my dough. My biscuit dough is absolutely ready. It's come together. That little addition of water has really helped. And what you want to do is just leave this for about 10, 15 minutes in the fridge, just so that it hard, starts to harden up again. As your hands have been working it, the butter started to melt and you need to just make it slightly harder, otherwise it's gonna completely spread out in the oven. There will be some spreading in the oven, but you don't want it to completely spread out. So I'm gonna put this in the fridge and then I will show you in a few minutes how to build your biscuits. Okay, so my dough has been in the fridge for about 15 to 20 minutes just to cool down a little bit to make it slightly easier to work with and also to try and stop it from completely falling apart when it goes in the oven. What you want to do is uh, grab some of your dough, I would say probably the size of a walnut, and give it a roll into a circle and put it onto your tray. I'm going to do six just to demonstrate, but um, uh, do it with the whole mix. So roll it into a circle. These are going to be your little balls of hail, which are going to be filled with the wonderful fiery jam. Let's have a glass of water or a bowl of water nearby because the next bit you do need to have a slightly uh, wet finger before you do. So, got my six onto the tray. 
space them out a little bit so that they don't uh, expand into one another. And get your finger and just dip your finger in some water and press into the ball. This will flatten it. But that's why you want to do uh, a wet finger, otherwise it's just going to stick to the dough. This is why it's called a thumb print, because you might use your thumb, but actually we're using a finger. Okay. Now, let me just show you what they look like. So, what we want to do is fill those little holes with the jam. Ideally, you're going to use strawberry jam because that is red and therefore will represent the fire. The problem is, when you are planning to do a, a, a video recipe and you forget to buy the strawberry jam, you use whatever jam you've got in your fridge. And in truth, any jam you like can go inside, but if you're really trying to get the feel of a hail, which is uh, filled with that red fire, you should go for strawberry jam. Or if you're being super clever, you'll go for a bit of strawberry and a bit of marmalade as well. But get some jam and just pour it into the hole. Now, at this point, you might choose to put them in the freezer for 10 to 15 minutes just to firm up even more because they will expand in the oven. And so the colder they are when they go in the oven, the less they will expand. I'm going to put these very straight into the oven. The oven is set at 170 degrees Celsius. It's going to go in for about 10 minutes. Keep an eye on it. If it starts to look like it's turning brown, then remove it because it will harden up once it is out of the oven. So 10 minutes time, I will see you to finish these off. So here it is, the final product, the white cookie with the jam in the middle representing the fiery uh, hail that rained down upon the Egyptians as one of the plagues. A really simple shamot snack for you to make. If you've got children and you're homeschooling, try it with them. It's really fun and really quite tasty. Have a great one. Shabbat shalom.